Thank you. Is your mic on? I think so. I am so incredibly excited to be here. I mean, super incredibly excited to be here. I haven't spoken for a balcony before. This is amazing. Um, I'm, yay, so excited. So, so I want you to know, you're up in the balcony, you may not be able to read this far away. We have a hashtag today. This is going to be live tweeted, hopefully by a lot of you. So, KU Med Art 13. That's our hashtag. And I look forward to seeing you on Twitter. Now I'll turn around this and make it art. <laughs> Multi-purpose people, it's really important. Okay, so I want to talk to you about what it is that I do. And if you see in front of you, that slide has this painting as well. That painting is um, entitled, My Baby, but also I use it in conjunction with the speech, The Eye of the Storm. And I painted this at a medical conference. I painted it at a medical conference. I was not going to get to a tent. See, I go to medical conferences and I paint there. And sometimes I get to speak there too, which is great too. And this specific medical conference was called Engage. It was about bringing patients and doctors together. Now, they had actually forgot to invite patients to it. So uh, the week before it was going to happen, they asked me, could I come? I'm like, sure, I can come. Do you want me to speak? They're like, no. I'm like, OK. Well, then I would like to paint on site, because that's what I do. And so we'll get back to people running the event. And I got a lovely email that said, we are sorry, but we are not allowing you to paint the event. The paint could spill. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I won't be attending your event. And I went to another conference, and the vice president of this company who was doing the Engage event ran into me. And she's like, oh, are you coming to our event? And I said, no, you didn't want me there. I might be messy. You know, patients, we sometimes are messy. And she went to her, her superiors, and she talked to them and said, we have to have her here. You don't know what Regina does. You're going to love it. And I came, and I painted, and I painted this. This was soon after the tornadoes had happened in Oklahoma. And I come from Oklahoma, and I'm very familiar with that space. And I'm familiar with the, the strife and the frustration of change. So in this, we have a doctor and a patient embracing each other. Or is it a husband and wife embracing each other? They are getting engaged. This makes a ring. This makes engagement. And when you talk to people in the regular world, that's what they think you mean when you say engagement. It's the most spectacular and sacred moment in a life. And that's what you're asking for. And I'm going to help you on that journey. See, when I was little, I couldn't read. Really struggled. Um, so, so what I would have is like encyclopedias like that, and you see that beautiful border? You don't see that much anymore in books. We've sort of gotten away from that. But the beautiful thing about a border is it helps people understand what the text is about. Just like a picture helps you understand what the text is about. And if you cannot read, it is incredibly important that you give pictures. So I would study that kind of thing to try to understand. And when I was in first grade, I would try to understand. I would write my letters backward, and, I, and my teacher would say, A is for apple. And I'd say, OK, got it. A is apple. They're like, no, 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 no. A doesn't mean apple. A is a sound. And I couldn't understand that, so I just drew an apple and thought that would work. And so after a whole year of this, at the end of the school year, I had a piece of paper I was supposed to bring home, and it had a little um, bumblebee on the top and a bunch of texts that I couldn't read. And I brought it home to my mom and I said, Mom, what does this say? Now, I don't think the teacher meant to have the kind of horrific pun that she had, but she did, which was the, the letter said, you'll be back. I had failed first grade. So the next year I would come back. And what I would do every day at recess is I would walk on a balance beam on the playground and I would draw on that wall. I would take shale and chalk and little pieces of sandstone, and I would draw all throughout recess, because all my friends had moved on. And I couldn't read, and I was that dumb kid that got held back. And my life was hard, but if I could draw during recess, maybe it wouldn't be so bad. At the same time, what was going on is I would watch television at night, and it allowed for me to get on the exact same page as my future husband, Fred Holliday, because he was watching the same shows that I would watch. And years later, we'd talk about them. And we realized those shows taught us how to be patients. You see, see, look at those shows. OK, so you've got, you've got Grandma Walton. She was on the Waltons. And I loved her because I didn't have a grandmother um, that was living. And in one episode, you know, she's making cookies. And she was so kind to the kids. And, and then she was gone. And we had no explanation why Grandma Walton disappeared. But then one year later, she came back. See, it turned out that the actress who played the part had had a stroke. And the producers brought her back anyway. 
And this was a really brave thing because this was before the American with Disabilities Act passed. There was no reason you ever had to let somebody who had a disability on television. But they did, and she could barely talk. She had very poor control of her face. But she was still Grandma Walton, and we loved her. And this was personally really important for me because later that same year, my mother had Bell's palsy. And I watched half of her face fall and wear an eye patch and her smile go away. But I knew it was going to get better because of Grandma Walton. Now, we also watched Quincy, and I was a huge Quincy fan. I mean, I was addicted to medical examiner shows at the age of seven. <laughs> so, so I love the show. And what I didn't realize at the time was that man who played the part, Jack Klugman, played a doctor on television. Well, he testified before Congress. He was the first celebrity to testify, and he helped pass the Orphan Drug Act. To this day, it allows for people to get the meds they need when they have a rare disease. And then there was MASH, Hawkeye Pierce. My husband loved this character. It's his favorite character on television. I loved him too. We actually all as a country loved him because in 1983, when the final episode of MASH came on the air, it had the largest viewing audience ever in, in television in this country. The first time it was beaten was in 2010 with the 2010 Super Bowl. Okay? It gives you an idea how many people watched that night. And I will tell you, most shows, when they're going to go off, they're going to do the song and dance number, right? Right? It's going to be all fun and games, and that is not what MASH did. We got to watch a doctor that we loved and cherished and we thought was super funny and great have a complete nervous breakdown on a program due to being in a bus where this woman had this chicken and the chicken just kept clucking and there was an enemy outside and he told her, you've got to make the chicken shut up. And she did. And the chicken died. And as the episode progressed, we realized it wasn't a chicken at all. It was a baby. It was her baby. And she made her baby suffocate in her arms to make it shut up. And the doctor had to deal with that. He had to deal with the fact that he caused death rather than life. That sometimes things don't work out, and that's what television taught us. Who else was there? Well, Hulk. Hulk, go watch the first episode of the Hulk again. Family program in the 1970s. And guess what? The first 30 minutes is a man dealing with abject grief over the loss of his spouse and the determination that he would spend the rest of his life doing whatever he could to change things so no one would have to suffer as he did. And then medically, the one that was the most important to me was Mary Ingalls on Little House on the Prairie, okay? I watched the episode where she was pulling out her eyes and squinting at the chalkboard. And I'm like, Mom, I'm doing what Mary's doing. I need glasses. And she said, no, you don't need glasses. You're only in fourth grade. I said, I do. I do need glasses. And I got to go to the eye doctor. Now, the eye doctor was very different than the regular doctor. See, occasionally we get to go to the regular doctor. We were really poor, so it wasn't very often. But when we were really sick, he'd look at my eyes, and look at my nose, look at my mouth, and he'd walk away from me. He'd walk up to my mom and say, Mrs. McCandless, your daughter, she's got an infection of the tonsil. She needs antibiotics. You should give her this, you know, get this prescription filled. Make sure she gets better. Come back if it doesn't work. And he would walk out of the room. He wouldn't talk to me. Eye doctor is completely different. See, what they do is they set you in this throne, okay? And, and then these glass slides start coming down, and then the doctor says, is this one better or this? <laughs> A or B? One or two? And all along, guess what? I realized I need to be in fourth grade, but I'm in charge. And by the end, click, 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 I can see. I can see the trees, the leaves on top of the trees again. It was beautiful. And that's the chart that I saw. The bad thing was, my life was hard, and I wasn't reading well, and I wasn't seeing well. And in fourth grade, I had an amazing teacher who got the fact that I had a disability called dyslexia. And she helped me with what's called an IEP, an individual education plan, so I could try to catch up with my class. And I was so proud, I was starting to do well in school. And I had a report card, and I had to write my name on it, but I had to write it wrong. See, I was named McCandless, and the little C is supposed to be first, and the big C is supposed to be second, but I reversed that. And she said, are you sure it's supposed to be that way? And I said, I think so. And then I brought that report card home. And my dad was not a very nice man. He drank. He had mental illness. So when he saw the report card, he began to write horrible things to my teacher because she was so stupid that she couldn't even get my name right. 
And I couldn't let that happen. It wasn't her fault. So I said, Dad, I'm sorry, it's not her fault. I'm the one who told her to spell it that way. Now I'd been brushing my hair with a pink hairbrush that was sitting on the dresser beside me. And he grabbed the pink hairbrush and smacked me on the side of the face because I was the stupid one. And I had to go to school like that. I had to go to school with this red welt on my face and I felt so embarrassed. And I sat outside my teacher's class and I just, I just couldn't go in. And the teacher came out and I sat beside her and I told her the hell that was my life. Everything that he had done to me, everything he was doing to us, and she gave me Kleenex. She gave me Kleenex, and she told me to wipe my face, maybe go to the bathroom and wash it off, and come back to class. And I did, and then nothing happened. A few weeks later, we had a visitor. We would occasionally have visitors. We had the dentist, you know, that gives you the pink things for your teeth to turn red. And we had the firefighter who did the stop, drop, and roll. But three weeks later, we had a police officer. And what he gave us was that hotline numbers. He said, if you are ever in a situation where abuse becomes too bad, call that number. And I had told her everything, so I guess abuse was not too bad yet. I guess I should wait a bit longer. So I waited for seven years, until the, day, the night my father threatened to kill the whole family, until the night he kept spinning a gun in circles on the table. And that is the night I left, when the abuse became too bad. I managed to survive my high school, and in, when I was toward the very end, Dad was out of the house, and I was doing pretty well. I was a reporter for the school newspaper, and we did this thing called the wellness check. And the wellness check was about how many students were sexually promiscuous, and was anybody on drugs, and was anybody drinking? And I never heard the results of the wellness check. So I went to the office and I asked the secretary, did we ever get the results of that, that survey we did? She said, oh yes, yes, we have a copy. I'm like, can I have a copy, please? And so I got a copy and I began to write my article and got called to the principal's office and found out the freedom of speech does not apply to high school students. <laughs> so it was not allowed to publish the results of the wellness check. Then, a year later, I went to school, and I met an amazing man named Frederick Allen Holiday II, and I met him in a scenic painting course. See, you'd paint these really big paintings like this with a huge paintbrush on the ground, and they were like five by fives, and, and we were both procrastinators, so we would stay all night painting, and we would talk about Stephen King, and we'd talk about politics, and, and whether country music, which I loved, or rock and roll, which he loved, were better, <laughs> and we'd have these huge debates, and we'd paint all night long, and by three o'clock in the morning, we'd all be throwing things at each other. Uh, as the debates continued. And I gotta tell you, if you ever wanna learn everything there is to know about somebody, pull regular all-nighters with them, right? <laughs> the filter is gone, <laughs> it's, it's the way they are. And we fell in love with that. So, we were really poor. We both sold our comic book collections. He paid, sold his to pay for our engagement rings, and I sold mine in order to pay for the wedding. And we got married, it was great. And then the years went on, and my husband got a master's degree in uh, an American university, and then he decided to get a PhD at the University of Kansas. So we came to move to Lawrence, Kansas, and I became the assistant manager of the Jayhawk bookstore. And so for three years, I lived in the state of Kansas and absolutely loved it. And we loved it so much, we decided to have a child while we were here. And my son, Freddie, was born at Lawrence Memorial Hospital, and you'll see him there. And one of the wonderful things about Lawrence Memorial Hospital is back in 1990, a doctor and his wife had the experience of having a child in the NICU. And they found out what a horror it is to not have a good place to be with your child while they were sick. So that doctor donated funds to create what was called the Segebrecht Room. It is a room that's still used every week in Lawrence Memorial Hospital so patients of compromised infants can stay and be with their loved ones and help them through the healing process. So my feelings from being here were amazing, and that that's the kind of care that hospitals provide. At the same time I was running the art department at the Jack Bookstore, there were some local arts folks who were asking me to be part of an arts festival. 
And I said, you know, I am very busy and I don't have time to paint. <laughs> they said, could you paint one painting? We just need more arts in the festival. And so I joined the festival and I painted this painting. And the painting is based on a part of Genesis where God has created the world and he knows it's not going to work out. And the angels are telling him to just let it go, to get rid of this version of the world because it's defective. And God decides not to. He keeps us. So I sat beside this painting, actually stood, in a hot park in Lawrence, Kansas, waiting for someone to look at me. And all the other artists have like posters and they have the little, you know, printed cards and they have tons and tons of paintings in a tent. And I'm sitting with an easel and just a painting. And I feel so out of place and so silly. And then a woman walked up. She was about six months pregnant, a little over maybe. And she looked at my painting and she just began to cry. See, she had been to her doctor, and there was something wrong with her baby. She was told there was something wrong with her baby, and then she was just to go home and figure out what she would like to do. And so she said she couldn't go home. She, she couldn't just go home. And so she saw this park, and she saw these artists, and she thought she'd come outside, and she'd be with people. And, uh, and then she read my poem, and she read my painting, and she said, it's going to be all right. I love my baby. I love my baby no matter what. And I hugged her. And I knew at that moment that the painting you see before you existed for one moment, for one person, in a field in Lawrence, Kansas. And it helped her life. So we moved back to Washington, D.C., and my husband kept working on his dissertation, and, and he wrote it, and he wrote it on uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which was, was great. He has a PhD from the University of Kansas on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I, I just love that. And, and um, um, I, I worked retail sales. I worked in a toy store, and I taught preschool art, and I did murals, and that was our life. And then on Christmas of 2007, this is our family. This was taken at 9 o'clock at night at church. Thank you, Ola Mills Photography, because they came out and did that. And we look so good for 9 o'clock at night, don't you think? And um, that's our only family portrait, and I'm very thankful for it. And this was a very hard time in our lives, because my husband and I were working six jobs between the two of us, yet we could not afford health insurance for our two children and for my husband. And so in January, we had some New Year's resolutions, and they were simple things like, we need to get medical insurance for the whole family. Fred needs to get a job in his field. Our son, Freddie, who's been diagnosed with autism, he needs a special needs school. Um, we need to spend more time together as a family. And finally, we're living in a one-bedroom apartment with a family of four, and one of those people is autistic. <laughs> well, we need a two-bedroom apartment. <laughs> and so that's all we are asking for. And I've got to tell you, we were blessed by God because most of that came true. Fred was hired at American University, which gave him his job with insurance, gave us more time to spend together as a family. My son, Freddie, was accepted into a special needs school, which helped with children with autism. And um, the only bad thing is we didn't get the two-bedroom apartment, but I thought, this is our year. Things are looking up. It's coming. Now, Fred loved his business card. He showed it to everybody. He was so proud. And the only bad thing about his work schedule was making him very tired and fatigued. He was losing weight, and we went to the doctor, and she diagnosed him with hypertension. So he was put on hypertension medication. Then in January and February of 2009, if you look at my husband's status lines on Facebook's backwards, you will notice he is in a lot of pain. He's tired, he's hurting, he's sick a lot. In January of 2009, he complains of rib pain, and he goes to the ER, and they said he'd broken his ribs potentially from a cough, because he had had a cough that January. My doctor thought that was odd, because he was only 38 years old. Then in February, he stopped worrying about the rib pain because he was having excruciating lower back pain. Went back to the doctor, and she gave us more pain meds. Now we're on two types of pretty strong pain meds, but she didn't prescribe laxatives. So now we have a new problem, a very embarrassing problem. So he goes back to the doctor. Now he's prescribed muscle relaxants, pain medicines, and laxatives. By March, my husband was on four types of very strong medication for, for pain two types of muscle relaxants, and four types of laxatives, and we had no diagnosis. On March 13th of 2009, we went to the local ER. It was a Friday night, and my husband was hurting so badly he was crying. So I said, let's just go to the doctor, let's go to the hospital, let's find out what's wrong, they'll do tests, 
So we gathered a bunch of toys for our kids, and we went to the pretty ER, you know, the one with the stained glass windows and the coffee shop and the gift shop and the pretty couches. And we waited for three hours. Then finally, someone from Express Wound Care said they were backed up. He would have no test that day and to come back um, to the, our regular doctor. And here was some more pain medication. The next week, I went with my husband to his regular doctor. I demanded an MRI, since she'd been seeing him for about six months at this point without diagnosis. We found out there was an MRI facility, oh, not too far away, in Olney, Maryland, that it was out in the country, it was rural. And they would not only do it in one day, they had an open MRI, which is great, because my husband was claustrophobic. So he went out there, got a CD, brought it all the way back into town, gave it to his doctor, and four days later, she called us. She called us to say, she would like us to make an appointment with an oncologist the next day that she knew, and here was the phone number. And I knew so little about medicine at that point, I did not know what an oncologist was. It is a cancer doctor. I made the appointment. On March 25th, my husband was hospitalized. And um, they said it was for tests, and I didn't know you don't leave a patient alone in the hospital. I thought it was okay to do that. And so I had kids at home, and I was supposed to go back to work, so I left him there. And on March 27th, I was at the toy store, and I was helping people with toys. When my boss came up to me and said, Reggie, it's your husband. And I picked up the phone, and my husband was crying. He said, Reggie, I'm so scared. The doctor was in here, and he says that I have tumors and growths in my abdomen. I have, a, I have a three centimeter tumor in my kidney, and I don't know what's going on. Could you please come here? And I hung up the phone. And I left the facility as fast as I could, and we got there in 30 minutes. But the doctor in charge of my husband's care had left town for a medical conference. He'd be gone for the next four days and would not be accessible by email or phone. I would go around that facility asking everyone, what's diagnosis? What's the treatment plan? What's going to happen next? On the fourth day, an on-call doctor came in our room because Fred had more tests. He had a PET scan. He had a CT scan. And we asked, what, did it spread? Is it gone beyond the abdomen? Would you, she said, you mean no one's come in here to talk to you? I said, no, no one talks to us. And they say we can't see the computers, and we're not, we don't know what's going on. So, so has it spread? And she said, it's everywhere. It's in his bones and it's in his lungs. And so that night I got on the computer and I staged my husband myself. He had stage four kidney cancer, and the chances were he was not going to live a very long life. When my, doc the hus my husband's doctor got back into town, he went to my husband at 7.30 rounds and said, so, Mr. Holiday, I understand your wife's been asking questions about this case. And my husband said yes. And the doctor said, well, if little Miss A-type personality has questions, she should come to my office hours. And I did, and this is a painting of that day. And it's realistic, except for the fact I had a chair, but I tell you, I was emotionally kneeling. He never closed the door. He never stopped talking on the phone. He never turned the computer screen around to where I could understand what he was talking about. That nurse, she's complaining about that one employee who keeps parking in the wrong place in the parking lot. And that transport clerk, she wants to know about Miss Rosen's chemotherapy suite and whether it'll be available later today. In between all these interruptions, he's saying big, long words I don't really understand. I'm trying to write them down in my journal. I say, please, could you slow down? Because I don't understand all these words, and I have to research them online. He said, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry, but I don't have a background in medicine. My only way to understand you is to research. And he said, that's right. I'm the one with the medical degree. So if you look on the wall in the background up there, it looks like, right there, it looks like a diploma. That's not a diploma. That says, I have the medical degree. And if you look over there, that's a family portrait, but I don't think it was done by Olin Mills. And then down here, that's us. That's my family. In the shadows, being broken apart. Now, some people have told me, you just had a bad doctor. I say, no, I just have an hour to give this keynote. There were so many other things that happened. When we went in for MRI, my husband was really, really upset because he was claustrophobic. And the woman said, take off your ring, take off your watch, calm them down. She didn't ask me to take off my ID pad. The minute the machine fired up, went in the ID into the machine. 
When Fred went to a radiation transport, we, we were asked, do you want palliative radiation? And we're like, palliative radiation, what does that mean? They said, oh, it will help the pain. I'm like, oh, anything that will help the pain, we want that. And then an outside EMT group came in, like the outside gear. And we're like, what's going on? Are we going downstairs? Like, oh, no, radiation doesn't happen on site. You've got to leave here. Now, one of the EMTs that day, it was her first day. She hadn't done a lift for someone like my husband. So instead of doing the pull-up, carry-over, she shoved. And what she didn't realize, she shoved a point of metastases and broke his hip while hospitalized. So all of these things were happening, and everything was getting worse, and we had no access to the medical record. There was nothing written that we could see, and they said we couldn't see the computers in the hallway. So I went down to this special place called Medical Records. It's in the basement. And I asked for an entire copy of my husband's medical record. And they said that will be 73 cents per page and a 21-day wait. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. It's right in that computer. All you've got to do is push print. And they said that's just the way it is. Well, the very next day, well, I've got to tell you about Stephen King. So I, at the same time I was trying to get my husband's medical record, um, my husband was a huge, huge Stephen King fan. And some of you may be watching Under the Dome right now, okay? That year, Under the Dome was coming out as a book. And if you were a giant fan of Stephen King, you knew this was the book that everybody had been waiting for for years because it had been lost 20 years before in a taxi cab. Okay, and he rewrote the whole thing. And Fred was waiting desperately for this book. But I'd been researching kidney cancer. I knew there's a good chance my husband did not have till November of 2009. So I emailed the book buyer at the toy store I worked, who emailed the publisher's rep, who emailed the marketing director, who emailed Stephen King, and asked, can we get this man who has cancer in Maryland a copy of your book? And Stephen King said yes. So we were sent a book by an A-list author seven months before publication but we couldn't get access to the medical record in which we were currently hospitalized. And then this day happened. So the very next day after I went down to medical records, I was wrapping presents for our children. And so what we'd do to make it where an autistic child and a three-year-old could come to a hospital and see their dad this sick was we would wrap tiny little presents and we'd hide them like Easter eggs in the room. And so it wasn't so bad, right? There were presents to find. And I was wrapping the presents when the doctor came in the room. He didn't really come in the room. He stood at the doorway. About as far away as Jan is right now. And we had a list of questions. There were simple questions like, when are we going to get surgery? And when are we going to get a palliative pain consult? And when are we going to get chemotherapy? And when are you going to give us a walker so Fred can try to walk again? And the doctor said, don't worry about the questions. We decided we're sending you home on a PCA pump. Well, that's being told you're being sent home to die without even having the bravery of using the word hospice. So we began to cry. You said you were going to treat us. You said, you, how are we going to go home? We have a, we have a one-bedroom apartment with two children. One has autism. And we don't even have a handicap-accessible door. How is he coming home? And the doctor said, well, that would be a question for the discharge nurse on Monday. And then he left us on a Saturday in a hospital. And that's the point my loving husband, who was so kind, and the nurses just loved him. He sent all the edible food displays to the nurses' station. And that's when he said, you go after them, Regina. You try to get me care. So I fought for five days to get a transfer to a different facility so my husband could be treated and given a second opinion. We were sent with an out-of-date and incomplete medical record and transfer summary. It was two weeks old which meant once we arrived at the new destination, they could provide no care other than a bed. The nursing station tried to cobble together using a phone and a fax machine the information they needed to get him back on his meds. The person who was the nurse in charge of the floor said, listen, honey, we can't even feed him. So we won't see if you go down and get a slice of pizza from the pizzeria. And that's how he ate that night. The very next day, the doctors in charge of my husband's care sent me back to the first hospital and said, we want you to go get his entire medical record so we can look at it. And I laughed at them in their face. <laughs> I said, I've been trying to get that medical record for four weeks. They won't give it to me. They said, they're going to give it to you this time because you're acting as a courier. You're getting it for us. They printed out the medical record in an hour and a half for the doctors. And I brought it back, and they read it. And then they gave it to me. 
I was astounded. They gave it to me, and they said, you're going to need it. You, you're going to be the one who provides care for your husband. He's going to be treated in many facilities, but you're going to be the continuity that he's going to need. And when I read my husband's medical record, I was furious because it was full of medical error, but it was also full of actionable data that had not been acted upon. On the first day he was admitted, back on 325, he had a test, and it said, patient has distended bladder. And on 326, and on 327, and on 328, all said, patient has distended bladder. On the nurse's progress notes of 47, it said, concern that patient is retaining urine. On the radiology report of 410, patient has dangerously distended bladder. And at this day, I found out about it, because that's when we had the off-site radiation. That radiologist came up to me and like, shook me a bit and said, Mrs. Holliday, I've been trying to reach your doctor. I've been trying to reach your hospital. They're not returning my calls. I want to let you know your, your, your husband has a dangerously distended bladder. It could rupture. You need to make sure he has a catheter placed when you get back to the hospital. Now, when I got to the nurse's station, I said, okay, I was talking to the radiologist. She says that we need to get catheter placed, but I need to let you know he has a pre-existing condition. He has something called urinary tract stricture. He's had catheter placed twice in his life. He needed a urologist. It's a, it's a hard procedure for him. And the nurses said, we're going to try anyway. So they tried with a 16-gauge catheter. They tried with a 12-gauge catheter, and then they gave up and called a urologist. He came the next day. The nurse's progress notes for that day say, patient refused treatment. So, <laughs> what does an artist do with that? With that anger and that angst? Well, we paint about it. So I painted a really big mural on a delicatessen in Washington, D.C. That's my husband's medical record writ large based on the nutrition facts label, something easy for those of us who don't follow medicine to understand. And at the same time this was happening, I was telling folks on Facebook, highly recommend you friend me. I love Facebook's timeline because guess what? Everything is still there as it happened in the order in which it happened. And all those people who became my friends then are still my friends today. Then I did something really scary. I worked three shifts at the toy store while my husband was sick. I call them sanity shifts. Because if you're the caregiver of a loved one, it's really, really hard. And it starts to get to you. So I went back to being a normal person for three days. And one of those days, I ran into an old customer. And she, she was there. And I started telling her, I said, I feel like I must tell you, my husband has kidney cancer. And she's like, oh. I've got to tell you something. I met this amazing man. His name is E. Patient Dave. And he survived stage four kidney cancer. I'm like, oh, oh, I must meet the E. Patient Dave. How do I meet this man? And she says, you get on Twitter. I said, I don't know the Twitter. <laughs> and that night, with the help of my 10-year-old autistic son, I sent my first tweet. And it's right there. I am trying to talk with Christine Kraft and E. Patient Dave. If you follow Twitter, you know I didn't even write that right. But guess what? Dave is so amazing, he fouled me anyway. And then he was emailing me, and he was talking to me on the phone. And by 10 o'clock that night, I was talking to Dave's doctor from Harvard, a world authority on kidney cancer. And I love that man. Because he listened to everything I had to say. And didn't brush me off. And heard it all. And was honest. He says, sometimes we catch these things too late. Sometimes it's just too late. So we went to hospice. And hospice is a beautiful, wonderful place, and I highly hope everyone in your life that you love gets the experience of hospice, where they love you and care for you and respect the end of your life. But all good things must end, right? So three weeks after we got in, the discharge nurse came. And she said, your husband's stable, so we have to see about sending him home now. I said, well, how are we going to go home? We have a, a one-bedroom apartment. We have two kids. One is autism. It's not handicapped accessible. How is he coming home? She said, have you thought about moving? So we moved in about a 24-hour time window to a new apartment, and my husband came home. That's how we got our final New Year's resolution. And for six days, I was in charge of my husband's care. For six days, I ran the MAR and all the meds. On the sixth day, he cried out in the middle of the night, Reggie, my catheter blew! And I called the nurse, and the hospice nurse came really quickly, and she placed a new catheter, and she was so good. And my husband said, you are really good at that. And she said, yeah, I worked at the VA for 20 years. <laughs> and then she started sweeping our floor, and we said, you don't just sweep our floor. And she said, you just go be with your husband. It was 2 o'clock in the morning by now. 
and we started pulling an all-nighter. I never heard of the word terminal restlessness. All I knew is I had my husband back, and we were talking, and we were talking all night long. And at 6.30, he looked at me and said, Reggie, you look so tired. You should go to sleep. I said, yeah, I think I should. I'll sleep for a little bit. I slept for one hour. And then I got up for 7.30 meds, because my husband was incredibly compliant. And I crushed up his little pills, and I put them in his mouth, and I said, honey, you just got to drink. You just got to get a drink this. And he didn't open his eyes, and he didn't talk to me. But he swallowed those pills. But he never spoke again. His breathing got so slow. I ran and got the children of my mother-in-law. We stood at his bed and we said, we love you, Daddy. We love you so much. And it is okay to go. It is okay. <laughs> and he stopped. We had a funeral. We had a memorial service. On Monday, I taught vacation Bible school. But on Tuesday, I began to paint. I began to paint a really big painting about my husband's care. It's called 73 Cents. I began to blog and tweet and Facebook and attend every single public policy meeting I could find in the District of Columbia. And that is the painting. It's 70 feet by 17 feet. It's called 73 Cents. It's my husband's electronic medical record writ large. There are 17 people in that painting, and not one of them is making eye contact with the other. And that must change. On October 20th, we dedicated the mural with songs from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. OK, it was an amazing night. And one of the last songs in that is, where do we go from here? And that is my question for you today. See, we're at a place that's really scary, aren't we? You are at a point in your life where everything is potentially changing. That boat there is called the old way of doing business. And she's jumping off the burning platform. We've got an HCAPS boat in the ground trying to save her. Speaking of age caps, why can't we paint about that? Why can't we paint about our report cards that are patient satisfaction scores? And do it where people can see us and talk to them about the care of the facility. I wasn't treated at George Washington, Medical, uh, George Washington University Medical Center. That's what's painted there. Never been there. Their data is available online. So anybody could see how folks feel about that. Meaningful use is a piece of legislation that's currently in place where electronic medical records are now being funded and we're starting to get access to the data within them. And I painted that painting within a diner. See, that's Kathleen Sebelius' as a waitress. And she's pouring coffee. That's stimulus, right? And she's got meaningful use pie. There's 15 core apple core measures in the back of that room. Because that's the kind of visual metaphor we need to explain things to people. The I in HIT, that's my son Isaac. I'm the I in HIT, you are too. It's not information, it's us. There are organizations and individuals who think that we should not be able to get to our information in a rapid fashion. They think 30 days wait is sufficient for care, and it is not. And if organizations and institutions will not work with us, look at those people with their mobile devices. People are amazing. They find ways around things. Personalized medicine is coming, and we need to do it together. That's Dr. David Shear. That's a painting about his mission, which is people who have electronic devices in their bodies that send information to the vendor and send information to the doctor do not send information to the patient. Information that could drastically affect their real-time life. That must change. I went to Bell and Health in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and I met this amazing woman named Betty Bundy. See, what happened at Green Bay um, was really cool. They have a great stroke program. And the CEO, who had been in housekeeping many years before, um, he asked his stroke team, how are we doing about oh, two years out with our stroke survivors? And they said, oh, we don't track that far. He said, get on the phone, find out. How are we doing? And they called up Betty. And they said, hi, Betty. This is Bell and Health. They went, how do you doing? And she said, who? Oh, Bell and Health? Oh, you sucked. Oh, you almost killed me. You lost my medical record. And it was amazing. And you know, a lot of facilities, they would have just taken a step back from Betty, right? <laughs> but what Bellin did is they invited her to a meeting, a 120-day strategy meeting. And she spoke from the stage like I do, and she's 84 years old, OK? And she has filter failure. 
It's amazing. I mean, she says whatever she thinks. <laughs> it's just great. And so, so they listened to Betty. They listened to her so much. They loved her so much that when they brought in a new electronic medical record system, they named it Betty. So instead of workflow anger that, oh, the new blah, blah, blah has come into town and we don't like that new system, you don't like Betty? Really? Because that's what this is all about. Ah, Blue Button. Okay, if you follow what's going on with VA the last few years, they did this really cool thing on My Healthy Vet, which was called Blue Button. And if you pushed it, you could get for free one whole year of your medical records from the VA. And they thought, this is such a great idea. Why don't we do it more places? So now some hospitals and insurers and other data holders are starting to have Blue Button. And the idea being as a patient, you can just go on there and click, and you get a whole data file for free not for 73 cents per page. There's also other individuals working on this. The Learning Health System from the Cantor Foundation is a whole bunch of people working together in what's called chaotic organization. Let's say it together, chaotic. I love that word. OK, chaos and order combined. That's how Visa cards started, OK? A whole bunch of people agreed to the, ex the belief that a piece of plastic could be money. That was a real foreign concept at one time. Okay? Now we all accept it. But we can do the same kind of things within healthcare. We can agree to share data. Another organization that's working on this is PCORI. They're working on patient research. And coming out of that painting, you'll see a hand that's holding patients like me. That's a patient's organization that's working on sharing data. Open notes. Okay, this is such a big deal, guys, if you don't know about it. In October of 2012, just this past year, they finished the Open Notes project, which was the idea that if doctors would let patients read their open notes, like completely open, it could improve care. That was the idea. Maybe it would work. That was the theory. And it was amazing, the results. Look at that. 90% of patients responded. They understood what they had read, and they were not bothered. Well, only 1% to 2% were bothered. 87% um, of patients enrolled in the study did check their notes, because people said, we're lazy, and we wouldn't bother to do it. Um, and then 80% of patients claimed greater adherence to medical protocols Due to access to notes, that is a game changer. If it was a drug, we'd all be buying it. Spectacular. And I heard about the 1 to 2 percent who were upset. One of them, the doctor shared his story. He had read for the first time in his medical record that he was morbidly obese. And he was so angry, he called the doctor. And the doctor said, oh, um, well, we have a way of getting that out of your medical record. And 60 pounds later, it's not there anymore. Okay, there is a protocol right now being worked on between the White House and ARC and RAND, and what the idea being that we could have a number that patients could call when the abuse becomes too bad. Right now, that doesn't exist. You're very scared to tell, as a child of abuse, I well know you can't go to your parents with that. When you're a patient who is suffering abuse, it's very hard to go to the facility in which your current getting treatment and complain that you are in pain and something bad is happening to you. You need an outside authority, and that's what they're trying to do. If you look at that painting, there are 17 authors in that painting, and all of them suffered something in a hospital setting or struggled to get appropriate care, and they wrote books about it. And I had to get a lot of those books as remaindered on Amazon because they're out of print, and every year a new book is written. One of the wonderful authors of one of the books in that painting is right here, Jerry Holland Buck. She's in your room right now. She wrote a book about it. And all these people dedicated months and years of their life to a book to try to change things. But a book in and of itself is not enough. We must communicate the information between all of us to change things. Michael Graves, he was a designer from Target had an infection that destroyed his lower spine and made him into a paraplegic. When he went to the rehab facility, he was aghast at how badly it was designed for anybody in a wheelchair. He's decided to dedicate his life to changing the physical footprint of hospitals and care devices, and he's doing it. He designed a brand new wheelchair that's amazing that he showed in Medicine X last year, and he's working with Stryker. So this is an individual who didn't even come from our space, but he's changing it and making it better. 20 cue ball. I bet some of you guys played with a 20 cue ball a few years ago. It's a toy by Radica Toys. Raise your hand. 
Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so so this ball, it asks you 20 questions, right? So it'll ask you, you know, is it an animal, is it a plant, all those kind of things. Within 20 questions, it usually gets it right. It's because it's loaded with a dictionary, a math mathematical logarithm, and auto taxonomy. And the really cool thing about that ball is, you know, the original code, human beings never won, ever. But they had to tweak the code to make it where we occasionally randomly get a win, okay? Because we also won't play if we always lose. <laughs> So, so that's a ball that's a toy that retails for $13.99. Why can't we have that kind of device in triage? Why can't we have a device that asks, do you have blood in your urine? Do you have night sweats? Do you have bone pain? Have you lost weight? Do you have kidney cancer? How to be a patient. My son went to a clinic appointment in Washington, D.C., where they handed him a netbook. He was five at the time. And they said, here you go. We'd like you to build your electronic medical record. And he was like, what? <laughs> he started. He actually typed what he could, and then I helped him. We asked all kinds of questions back and forth. So we finished, we pushed submit, and then went on the internet to the reception desk. We carried the netbook back to the reception desk. And she says, you just submitted it. I don't need the netbook. You can just spend the rest of your appointment Googling or looking at YouTube videos, whatever you'd like to do. And then we went into the office of the doctor, and he pulled up the diagnosis, and he showed him on the little screen what it was that my son had. And then, and then my son was so excited. He, he just felt part of it all. And then we went to our regular checkup one month later. And our regular doctor had her back facing my son, was typing into the computer, and she was asking me questions. And my son gets the wiggles. He jumps off that table and said to the doctor, when's it my turn to type? And that's what's coming. You might have noticed I have a jacket on with a painting. And if Jerry would stand, she's a member of this as well. She also has a jacket with a painting on it. See, there are those of us who walk around the world telling our stories on our back. And it is called the walking gallery. And at this point, there are 237 members. Thank you, Jerry. And you can be one of them as well, because Jerry's one of the few members in this area. You see, when I was in the hospital with Fred, my son, I, uh, Freddie, the, the older one, said, Mommy, I don't like that faces of pain chart um, because those faces aren't real. Human beings don't look like that. So I drew something like this that showed real faces, real pain. See, my son was in an autism school. They have hundreds of faces they show them to figure out what people feel. And we need to use those kind of devices and tools with our patients today. Look at the work of Rosalind Picard. She's working on technology that will help us do this. My son, Freddie, also said when he joined the walking gallery, he wanted me to paint this painting, which was the kiosk in a parking lot with a skull on top, with coins and the eyes and the mouth and falling down. He said, I want you to paint that, Mommy, because you should make a family pay to park when they're watching Daddy die. My younger son, Last year, he wore a jacket he painted himself called Feelings, and he marched in a parade and, and everything. This year, he wanted me to paint a painting about Ghostbusters. I was like, Ghostbusters? How are we going to make that work with a walking gallery? He says, oh, it's going to be Diabetes Busters. <laughs> I'm like, really? This is pretty cool. OK, what's going to be the fire? We talked about what could be the fire, and we decided it couldn't be fruit, because there's this idea in society that if they just would have eaten correctly, they wouldn't have got sick. And all, a lot of stage one diabetics get very upset with his attitude that they must have done this to themselves. So instead, that fire is the insulin molecule. And if you look at all the Ghostbusters, they're wearing vintage 1960s insulin pumps. <laughs> and then there's me, little Miss A-type personality. <laughs> and if you look at this kind of painting, it's a little different than all the rest of my work. See, that's called painting a negative space. I did not paint the A, I painted the world around it. So you can take a negative and you can turn it into a positive. At this point, we, we've made little Lego figures of the whole walking gallery. See, none of us can get together in person. So once a year, we gather, or sometimes twice a year, and we bring all our little Lego selves so we can all be there. And I love it because that's the kind of toys and love and childhood that needs to be part of medicine. I also wanted to address the fact I started a campaign to create hospice cards at Hallmark. And I began this campaign this past year. And I partially did it because of my story and because of Morgan. This was a girl who worked at the toy store. And she didn't get to say goodbye to her mom. See, she was on a trip. And she was visiting Ireland. And her mom was sick, but she didn't know how sick. And it wasn't made clear how sick her mother was. 
So Morgan didn't get to say goodbye because we don't talk about death in this country. And one way to change this is if pop culture, television, and even Hallmark cards start using the word hospice. We had an event here in Kansas City. It was called Partnership with Patients. We had it in September of last year. There were a lot of wonderful people who came. Jerry came, and I was honored to be here. There's a vibe and an energy that even Google recognizes in Kansas City. I think you guys can change the world. I think you could be the beginning of something amazing. And I hope to get to be part of that with you. Thank you. It should be on, but let's see. So, so one of the things that helps me help you all make this change faster, one of the tools is a thing called speaker link that I helped build with Texas Medical Institute of Technology. It's anybody who's willing to speak on these topics. You want to speak about patient-centered care. You want to speak about the patient view. It's totally free. So if you list yourself on there and let me know about it, when people ask me, who can I come, come speak in the Kansas City area on this topic, or who can I have in the middle of America come talk on this topic, I know about you. And I have a profile I can quickly send to a venue and say, them. Also, because of my continuously harping on this, CMS now uses it and HHS to get speakers. And that partially came out of, speaker link actually partially came out of, I was doing dishes in my kitchen when I got a phone call for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, and they wanted a speaker. OK? I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, I'm your resource? I'm the resource for the federal government to find a speaker in this town? <laughs> <laughs> that's wrong. So, so we need technology to help out getting the voice out. So that's one way. So if you're comfortable speaking, if that's not your thing, there is the gallery. We're always accepting new members of the walking gallery. You have to wear your jacket two to three times a year at a public event or medical conference. And the idea is you spread the idea of the patient story. You spread your inner center. You spread why you care so deeply. You change the conversation from being about bar charts and graphs to being about story and love and power, right? And it just starts causing ripples. People who walk in rooms with their jackets on often cause ripples of change, where more people start talking about their stories. I mean, for instance, depression. We have two jackets on depression in the gallery. I would love to see more. But what that's allowed to have two, even, is then people in the room are given permission about the fact that they're depressed and they can talk about it. So much of what's going wrong in this country, in this nation, is people don't feel like they've been given permission to say what's bothering them and in their true inner self. And once we start addressing the failures within our own lives, we can start correcting them. So that's another way. The other thing is, of course, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Get in touch with us on social media. On Facebook, we had the Partnership with Patients Facebook group, which is great. Lots of information through that. Um, Twitter, we run the hashtag, The Walking Gallery. Um, and LinkedIn, we have a, uh, a walking gallery group as well that we talked during that. And we try to like, spread the word between all of our members about what's going on, who needs help, and it just gets to become a, like a fireball that keeps rolling. Did that answer? OK. Other questions? Yeah, I got, ran out of time. I'm so sorry. OK, so you guys get to be the special ones. You get to hear the preview of the painting. Um, I, I'm painting Murphy. So, so um, the building I was painting in this morning was Murphy Hall. OK, so here's Murphy, right? 
And um, so there's the top of the building as the hat, and the columns become hair. And I've painted a very androgynous figure. So um, it, is it a woman or is it a man? You don't really know for sure. And it's hard to actually give gender to a building. But, but I was told that the, um, this is the nurse swing, and this is the, um, you know, the interprofessional ring, and up here is the uh, administration. And so, of course, administration is the brain, right? But when I, when I saw the hands go out to describe the hallways, I'm like, that's actually wrong if you're interprofessional. It's this, and it's this. Because we're working together. We're not going apart. So I'm trying to paint the entire thing that you're working on, but do it as a visual symbol. And then after I finish these, usually the venue keeps it or raffles it or auctions it. It's the venue's decision. And then I also blog about it and post it online. I spread it with a Creative Commons license. So at this point, I have almost like 400 paintings online with Creative Commons, which means that all of you are welcome to use them in your slide decks, in your advocacy. You just have to give attribution on your final slide. So this is a great thing. Like I told CMS about this. They're like, what are you talking about? Like Creative Commons, it rocks. You don't have to have those really nasty stock photography that you've got. You, <laughs> you can have great imagery, real patients, real people, and real paintings. And it's amazing what that can do to, to make your words have more power. So any other questions? Well, thank you, and I hope you consider joining the walking gallery or speaker link so we can spread that story. I know it's hard right now because you're an active caregiver, but if life gets to a point where you're able to be more public in your dedication, it would be wonderful to have voices like yours. Welcome. Okay, I do want to let you know there's something special here in this room right now. The really large card I made to give to Hallmark that's a hospice card is to encourage them to go more deeply in the direction of hospice. Um, you're welcome to sign it if you'd like. And we will be giving it with the lovely health of Jerry to them in a giant envelope. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, it was really a pleasure to get to speak before you. Thank you.